Everything in life serves a purpose. As trees provide oxygen to breathe or the sun, bringing light so we can see rain, helping flowers bloom, making room to bring them back to life once the seasons change. See, life is produced through creation, like a baby. It's formed in the mother's womb, humans creating rocket ships to reach the moon or liquor stores at every corner to stay consumed. We can sometimes create from a place of pride or fleshly desires, allowing worldly conceptions to contaminate our minds, but is this how God intended for us to be? You see, God created you to live in harmony, peace, and truth, a life of worship, hope, and fruit, a place where no darkness can stay, providing a love that would take it all away, from addictions to freedom, from broken to healed, from bound in sin to sealed in glory in the name of Jesus, you are forgiven because he has risen. And by his blood we are free from death to life being transformed into who he's calling us to be. This is our purpose. And Jesus was the purpose to bring us back to life from being that dead flower, bringing light to see salvation, opening a door between us and God to see a new season in faith in order for you to receive the gift of restoration. So let us not be limited by our circumstances, pain, or sin, as our God is not a God of limitation, but a God of boundless love and endless grace, willing to show this by sending His only begotten Son in order for us to be freed. Now what will you do with this truth? Will you allow it to produce fruit? Will you allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify, renew, and restore you back to the image of your Creator through our Savior?
to see you guys this morning. Y'all look good. Are you guys ready? Because today is something special. Somebody say special. Today is so special. Well, hey, if you're joining us online, what's up? We're so glad you're here with us. We can't wait to see you in person and everybody in the house. My name is Mariah. It's my honor to welcome you to today's celebration. It's going to be amazing. We're going to worship, hear a powerful message, and it's going to be tons of fun. And if this is your first time here or you're newer to this whole church thing, I want to say welcome home. Yeah, this is your safe place. And it's an exciting day to be here, the best day to be here, because Easter is all about God's great love for you and me. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, still in our mess, in our past, in our drama, Jesus died for us. And he loved us so much. And so I want to encourage you guys today. Maybe you're in this place and you're like, well, I don't know if I really fit or if I belong, God. I'm kind of feeling some type of way. I want to encourage you that this is your safe place. And I believe that God wants to show you his love in a fresh way today. Whether you've been coming for decades or this is your first time in a church room, even online, y'all, God wants to show you his love today. So would y'all stand up on your feet with me? We're going to worship. And however you feel comfortable, whether you want to jump or shout, dance, or just kind of sit there and sway, that's all good. However you feel comfortable, let's dive in and before we do that let's pray jesus we thank you for your resurrection we thank you that because of what you did on that cross and that you rose again that we can rise up out of our graves too that we can rise up out of our past too that we can rise up out of our problems too that we can have new joy new hope new peace new confidence and new life today in jesus name we pray and we say amen come on let's worship
how great your love is that you did not abandon us you did not forsake us it's so overwhelming to understand Jesus that you laid your glory aside and took upon yourself the form of a servant who was made in the likeness of a man and you humbled yourself unto death even the death of the cross that we celebrate this day because you are risen and we are free come on give God one more shout of praise hallelujah glory to God Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Man, it is good news, is it not? We come here today to celebrate because there is good news for every single man, woman, and child. Praise God. Well, guys, I'm Pastor Ken, the lead pastor here at Vertical. To all that are visiting with us today, so grateful that you're here be a part of this family of faith. To all of you that are watching us online, we love you. We're excited. To all in the overflow areas, we are excited today to celebrate together because this is good news. Amen. So you may greet one another this morning as you are seated. Well, guys, I'm excited to share something with you today, but let's all bow our heads and pray together in this moment. Father, thank you as we take the time today to remember what you accomplished for us through the death and resurrection of our Savior and Lord. Today, may your word become so personal. May it become so real. May your love envelop our hearts to recognize just what we meant to you. And Jesus how can we ever say thank you enough for coming into this earth, taking upon yourself the form of a human and being one that would stand in our place, take our sins to a cross. But Lord, we celebrate today because you are risen and we are free. Thank you today. May the joy of the Lord fill our hearts as we share this in Jesus' name. Everybody in agreement with that, say amen. Well, I absolutely, positively love Easter. I love this, this time. Because why? Why is it such a celebration? Why is it such good news for all, for all of us? Why is this day significant? Why is it such a big deal? Well, how many of us don't love the story of a great battle that leads to a victory? I mean, think about all of the different themes in movies and television and, and novels that people love to read. See, at the end of World War II, there was joy and celebration across the whole earth. Why? Because a great victory had been won that had implications for all of humanity. But that battle came at a significant cost. Battles are never pretty. No matter how we try to glamorize them through art, through our television, through our movies, through our novels and all the rest. No, Fighting is bloody. It's gory. War is hell. But the glory is not in the battle, but in the sacrifice it takes to win the battle. You see, fighting is difficult, but why do we fight? To end tyranny, to stop oppression, to stop the opportunities, to bring about the opportunity for peace, for freedom, for liberty, for healing, for redemption, for restoration. So this morning, I want to take a few moments and talk to us today about a huge battle that took place and a victory that brought good news for all of humanity and to us personally, for you and for me. Good news that has the ability to radically change our lives for good in ways we may have never even imagined. Because the story that the Bible tells is a story of an epic battle for the souls of humanity. You see, God created humankind in his own image, in his own likeness. He gave us all freedom. The ability to choose, a free will, to choose what we would do, to choose our own destinies. Why did he do so? Because God is love. Without choice, there is no love. There is no ability to accept it. God took the chance that we would choose a relationship with him, to choose the partnership that he desired to rule his creation together with him. But yet an enemy bent on evil 
came along and offered a choice that unfortunately as humans, we've all made the choice because something that was promised that would seem to fulfill us, seem to bring us a sense of happiness, in the end, leaves emptiness and pain, difficulty and suffering. You see, the idea is this. Why? This idea, the problem of evil is something that humans struggle with to the millions. People walk away from faith because the understanding is this. Either God is almighty or God is good. He cannot be good and he cannot be almighty at the same time. Because why would evil exist so much in our world? But today I want to tell you the story because God is faithful to his promises. Right at the onset of human rebellion, right at the the epicenter of human sin entering the garden, God stepped in to make a way that would provide redemption for all humanity. You know, people say to me, Ken, why can't God just forgive everybody? Why can't God just say, oh, you're all forgiven? Well, listen to me. If you hit my car and you ask me to forgive you, I can forgive you, right? But what about the damage to my car? Who's going to pay for the repairs? See, we all desire in our culture justice, but there's no justice without judgment. God is holy, and he owes it to all that is good, to all that is pure, to all that is right, to do what is right. But he gave the choice. Either humans could pay the price, or he would step in to pay the price. Because God said right at the very beginning, He said the seed of a woman would come and crush the head of a serpent and that the serpent would strike his heel. In other words, this cryptic prophecy that God promised that he would step in to do something for us that we could never do for ourselves, but it would come at a great cost. Jesus was God's ultimate search and rescue plan for all humanity. Because God continued to make promises throughout all of the failures of humankind. What became known in the Jewish scriptures as a figure known as the Messiah. That he would come and set all things right. He would restore all of God's purpose and plan to the world that we live in. But so often today in our culture, secular people want the kingdom without the king. They want to return to a garden without the God who created the garden. But God came in the figure of the king, the Messiah. And Jesus came into the midst of it to fight a battle on our behalf. This epic battle that had been going on, it all heated up. At the moment that he was born, Satan filled the heart of the king to create genocide to just infants. All children under the age of two in the town of Bethlehem were to be eliminated. All of that, but that that battle ultimately led to the cross. So if I were to put a title on what I want to share with you today, it's this, what happened from the cross to the throne? Because the first message that was preached after the resurrection of Jesus, Peter The apostle that had denied Jesus three times in his greatest hour of need. The one that felt that he was a total failure had been restored. Something had changed because now his followers who once hid in fear behind locked doors were now out in public declaring to the same people that had called for Jesus' crucifixion. Listen to what Peter said on on that day. On the day of Pentecost. It's found in Acts chapter 2 and verse 23. It says, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Notice this, God had a plan. God the Father and God the Son came up with a plan to bring about the redemption of all humanity. God did not spare his own son, but Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down freely, I will take it up again. God had a plan that was so amazing, difficult for humans to try to grasp the understanding of how much we actually mean to Almighty God. In fact, It was so great that the enemy himself could not understand it because the Bible says of the devil that he would not have crucified the Lord of glory if he had known, if he had known. And so Peter goes on to say this. He says this, he says, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was not possible for death to keep its hold upon him. 
What was Jesus condemned for? What was he given over to die for? Because he had claimed that he was the Messiah. He had claimed that he was the one that had come to restore all things. But yet now God vindicated Jesus and showed he was the true Messiah. The one that had been promised. Because he had come to set humans free. But notice what Peter said. He said he freed him from the agony of death. Because it was not possible to hold him in it. You see, once somebody dies, physically there's no more pain. But you and I must recognize this. That from from the scriptures, death is more of a transition than it is a termination. Yes, the physical body terminates its life. But there is more to humankind than just a body. The realization that there is a life after death. And there is a transition from once somebody dies. And Jesus, when he died, took the full penalty for humankind. Jesus came to fight a battle for us that we could not fight on our own. Because look at what Peter went on to say. David said said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices, my body also will rest in hope because he will not abandon me in the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence. Fellow Israelites, hear Peter saying, I tell you confidently that our patriarch David died and is buried. And his tomb is here to this day. He was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what has come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he would not abandon him in the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God raised this Jesus to life, and we are witnesses of it. You see, when Jesus died, It looked like the war was over. The champion who had come to take on the one who held the power of death and the grave. Jesus' limp body, lifeless and dead on the cross, looked like all was over. Looked like it was finished. That now the war, the enemy, had won. That's what the disciples believed. They thought it was all over. They once put their faith in Jesus, but when Jesus died on the cross, all of them lost their faith. All of them ran in fear. Now they realize that, whoa, this is, he must have went too far. He must have sinned. It must not have been what God had intended. This all came crashing down. That's what they believed. You see, but Jesus' death and resurrection was God's decisive blow against evil. Because Jesus took the place. The Bible says through death, he defeated him who had the power of death. That is the devil. In other words, when Jesus died, he he said, David, being a prophet, said, God will not leave him in the realm of the dead. Where did Jesus go when he died? He descended into the lowest depths of hell. Why? Because scripture says he was made sin so that we, could be made the righteousness of God. He suffered in every way. See, people, they misunderstand. Hell was never created for humanity. It was created for the devil and his angels. Hell is a place that is absent from all of the goodness of God. So often, we take the goodness of God for for granted. We fail to realize that God's goodness is all around us. But Jesus descended into the depths, to the lowest depths of hell. And there was a party. There was a celebration because the devil thought he won. For three days, there was, there was tormenting this one. They thought was the one. And now he was defeated. Now he was at their disposal. But yet, when all of the, the price had been paid, when the scales of justice had been met in full, God the Father said, enough! And now... He looked over to the Holy Spirit. He says, go, raise my son. See, Jesus had been suffering in the lowest parts. But you see, I grew up in Stanford, Connecticut, okay, the home of WWE. 
Have you ever watched one of those things? You know, all of a sudden, or like, you know, or, or, or ultimate fighting, when somebody's trying to pin somebody down, Jesus never tapped out, okay? No matter how much, yeah. Because now, all of a sudden, okay, just when the devil thought he had it done, it was not over. The Holy Spirit descended. It's kind of like when I was a kid, I watched Popeye cartoons. And when Brutus was kicking the snot out of Popeye, there would come a point when he said, I've had all I can take and I can't take no more. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit quickens the body of Jesus. And then the fight is on because Jesus arises. Listen to what Paul writes in the book of Colossians. I love this. Colossians 2.15 says, And when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, whose supernatural forces of evil operating against us, he made a public example of them, exhibit, exhibiting them as captives in his triumphal procession, having triumphed over them through the cross. You see, when Jesus was made alive in the spirit, the scripture says. He was the first one born from death unto life. And now rising from the dead, he goes over and takes the keys of death and the grave. Why? Because when John the apostle sees Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, Jesus said, I was, I am the living one. I was dead and I am alive and I have the keys of hell and death. Where did he get them? Because the battle was won. Jesus made a public display of the enemy. You see, for, for a millennial and a half, the greatest metaphor for the cross was Jesus victorious, Christus victus in Latin. In other words, it wasn't until the Reformation that the idea of the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus became the predominant metaphor. But no, this is the reality that God gave his ultimate and decisive blow against evil in his campaign against it. Jesus' resurrection was like D-Day was in World War II, that now, on that day when the Allied forces hit the beaches of Europe, that the Nazi regime, on June 7th, 1944, the war had taken a turn. Now the Nazi forces was over. It would take almost a year of that campaign to reach Berlin, but the victory had turned. The battle had been won, that now there was a change. And you and I must realize, Jesus will come back and finish the job to eradicate evil. But in the interim, now he's bringing liberty and freedom to every single soul. No longer does sin have control over humanity. No longer does hell have the right to dictate the, the, the ways of it. Jesus said, arising from the dead, he said, all authority has been given to me, both in heaven and in earth. Now you go, and in my name, you will cast out devils. In my name, you will lay hands on the sick. Jesus gave us the power of attorney to use his name because at that name every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. He gave us the armor of God. He gave us weapons of warfare that are mighty through God to destroy the strongholds of the wicked one. Now this you and I must realize as a Christian we don't fight for victory. We fight from a place of victory. Why? Because Jesus is Lord. He brought the kingdom to the earth. And now all are invited to become a part of it. Now we can be recipients of the victory that Christ brought for us. That's what's important because Jesus, his victory became our victory. See, God is not against you. God is for you. He is with you in it, working through you, fighting for you. He has given us the victory through Christ. But there's also another reason to celebrate Easter. Another part of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, from the cross to the throne. Jesus' death and resurrection, listen to me. His death and resurrection secured our freedom from our past, from our sin, from our guilt, from our shame. Jesus restored the opportunity for all mankind to be reconciled to God. The Apostle Paul would write it this way, that God was at work in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Listen, not holding our sins against us. See, when Jesus arose from the dead, see, God the Father made Jesus to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of God 
in him. Jesus offered us the perfect life of his righteousness as a gift. But the Bible tells us something that happened. Now the New Testament writer saw revelation because while they thought it was all over, Jesus came as a high priest. The day that Jesus rose from the dead, Mary Magdalene was at the tomb and she thought that Jesus was a gardener. She said, where have you laid his body that I may go to him? And Jesus says to her the only way, just in the way he could, he said, Mary. And immediately she knew who he was and said, Rabbi. And she went out to, to grab a hold of him. He said, listen, do not touch me, for I have not ascended to the Father and to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Now go, tell my disciples. But later that night, Jesus appears to the disciples behind closed doors. And they're frightened. They're wondering. And he says, handle me. A spirit has not flesh and bone as you see me have. So what happened from the moment at the tomb when Mary said, and he says to her, don't touch me, to the place he says to the disciples, go ahead and handle me. This is what the book of Hebrews tells us. Jesus as our high priest, listen to this. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 11, it says, so Christ has now become the high priest over all good things that have come. He entered that greater and more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Redemption. He settled the debt. He paid the price. Restoration. And a return was now possible for all human beings because Jesus, where we had seen in the tabernacle, in the temple, that the high priest would go before the people into the, the, to, to the, what was called the most holy place. And he would take the blood and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat to bring forgiveness for the people. That was only a shadow of that which is to come. Now Jesus, as our high priest, entered into the heavenly holy of holies and he took his own blood and sprinkled the mercy seat once and for all to eradicate sin, to once and for all secure our freedom, that we would no longer be condemned, that we would no longer need to be separated from God. Jesus' death secured the opportunity that all of us could be redeemed, restored, made whole, brought back to the place. Listen, the resurrection of Jesus is the story. His death would have never made any sense if he hadn't ro risen from the dead. But it secured both the victory that we all needed and the restoration that humanity desperately needed. It was proof of God's love and faithfulness for all of us. But the resurrection of Jesus, listen to me, the resurrection of Jesus also resolves a far more personal issue for each of us. Because the, re the death and resurrection of Jesus resolves the idea of what does God think about me? How does God look at my sin? How does God handle my failures? How does God feel about me? How does God see me? When you understand the death and the resurrection of Jesus, you for once and for all realize just how much you mean to Almighty God. How much He loves you. How great of a way that He went to bring the opportunity for restoration for all mankind. But just as every Jewish child that's born in Israel can be a partaker of the covenant, they don't become one of a partaker until they're circumcised. The realization that there's a decision. From heaven's point of view, all the barriers have been removed. All the guilt, all the shame, all the sense of shying away from God. Now the doors have been thrown open wide. And all are invited to come. That we can be reconciled to God. Because no longer is God holding our sins against us. It's a free gift. Eternal life. Is not a reward for good people, but it's a gift for forgiven people. To all who need forgiveness, the way has been made. To all who want a reconciled relationship with God, the price has been paid. That's why Easter is a celebration. That's why this is good news to every man, woman, and child on the face of this planet. 